All right, let's turn it over to Chris to start with our devotional since people are still coming, but we want to be on time tonight. So Chris, I'm going to see if I can spotlight you. Uh, okay. Yeah, I can only put you at the top. <laughs> All right, this is from uh, Bread for the Journey, Henry Nowen, and it's titled Letting Go of Our Fear of God. We are afraid of emptiness. Spinoza speaks about our horror vacui, our horrendous fear of vacancy. We like to occupy, fill up every empty time and space. We want to be occupied. And if we are not occupied, we easily become preoccupied. That is, we fill the empty spaces before we have even reached them. We fill them with the, our worries saying, but what if? It is very hard to allow emptiness to exist in our lives. Emptiness requires a willingness not to be in control, a willingness to let something new and unexpected happen. It requires trust, surrender, and openness to guidance. God wants to dwell in our emptiness, but as long as we are afraid of God and God's actions in our lives, it is unlikely that we will offer our emptiness to God. Let's pray that we can let go of our fear of God and embrace God as a source of all love. Uh, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our gathering this evening. May you continue to bless the Stephen ministry at our church and provide guidance and wisdom to our group as caregivers and also bless our care receivers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, Dr. Parik is coming to us from San Juan, Puerto Rico tonight, and we're so grateful to you for being with us. This is the group of Stephen ministers at First Presbyterian Church who are trained for more than 50 hours before they even begin the ministry here of lay pastoring, basically, um, walking with people in our congregation in various kinds of needs. Uh, we walk alongside them. We are not the uh, solution fix it people, but we're the be present to you in the midst of what you're going through people. And um, several of us have uh, what we call them care receivers. Several of us are assigned to people that have struggled with depression or other kind of mental health concerns. Uh, some are situational issues, divorce, perhaps loss of a loved one. But some of the uh, folks will have people with depression, which I know you're familiar with uh, <laughs> as an understatement. Um, and we have had a couple of members of our church who've approached me to say that they are currently using ketamine for depression. And when I heard of that, knowing that it was new to me, I assumed it would be new to this group as well as a resource. We've since learned a little bit more about ketamine and palliative care and other places. So we were just hoping to learn more and to be able to know what this resource may be and to hear from you about where this is heading as well. So with that, I know you're going to present your credentials at the beginning of the session, but we'll turn it over to you, Dr. Parikh, and we're so grateful for you to be here from San Juan. Well, uh, thank you very much for that in, uh, introduction, and uh, uh, my apologies for looking informal. I, I love wearing ties, and uh, I usually have a jacket and all that, but uh, I am in Puerto Rico uh, for, for a research conference, but it's more informal, so I didn't bring a tie or anything like that here. Um, so <laughs> what uh, what I'm going to do is maybe I'll share just two minutes of my background, and 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 then what I'd like to do is hear... Um, your questions, some of your questions right up front, and this can include um, skepticism or, you know, certain misgivings or or uh, bad things you've heard about ketamine and so on. So um, just a little bit about me. I, I was a primary care doctor. Well, first of all, I'm Canadian. I, I've uh, been going back and forth uh, over in the course of my life to the U.S. Uh, for various training or for uh, work in my latest iteration, I've been at the University of Michigan now for uh, eight years. Um, so I am a psychiatrist, but for four years I was a primary care doctor and I worked in a rural area. So I'm pretty familiar with all kinds of, uh, all kinds of medical problems and all kinds of social problems. Uh, and I've lived in many different places, uh, both in remote areas as well as in big cities. Did most of my career in Toronto lived for a while in New York, did most of my career in Toronto, and um, moved to Michigan eight, eight years ago. I, I At the University of Michigan, I run the depression clinical program, as well as the clinical research program. 
And um, I'm a very practical, hands-on kind of person. My first degree was actually engineering because I wanted to understand how things work. And then I switched into medicine. Uh, so um, so uh, among the things that I do is I, I actually see a lot of patients uh, through my career. I've been quite involved and I deliver all kinds of treatment. I, I, uh, I run the IV ketamine clinic for depression uh, at Michigan Medicine. I do transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is a, a device that goes on your on your scalp. Uh, I, of course, do the usual stuff of uh, assessing people and prescribing medicine. But I also run groups and I do a fair bit of psychotherapy as well. And my my main motto is just be useful and use all the tools in the toolbox. So I'm not doctrinaire that I have to use one tool or the other. I'm just interested in using what tools work. And I do believe quite a bit in um, having rigorous evidence to support oh, your selection of tools. But so otherwise, uh, you know, I'm willing to mix in uh, whatever tools work. So that's my background. And um, it's in that within that spirit of pragmatism that I, you know, got involved with ketamine more than a decade ago. But before I launch into my talk, I'm just curious, what are some of the burning questions or the misgivings that you may have about ketamine? Uh, I'd, I'd welcome some thoughts. What does uh, ketamine do that an SSRI or a typical antidepressant isn't doing? In other words, because typically ketamine is uh, it's when you've been further down the road and with regard to, you know, typical antidepressants. Yeah. So th that, I, I will get to that in the heart of the talk, but I think the, the short answer is the short answer is that um, it um, it works much more directly through different brain systems than the traditional antidepressants. The traditional antidepressants, uh, you know, are I mean to use a, a loose analogy, um, you know, they they are fine tuning some of the systems that eventually it's kind of like watering and fertilizing a plant, and and you know gradually the plant grows. Um, this is more like you've got an incredible um, growth hormone that you inject directly into the plant and you bypass like watering and sunshine and, and fertilizer and you're directly stimulating the plant to grow and it grows, you know, much faster. Okay, thank you. I'm interested in what the safety concerns are with ketamine. Yeah, it just seems I, like a bad drug to me. <laughs> Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm going to I'll say that now because it's such an important issue. And I do have some comments, um, you know, near the end of my slides. So the, the main wow. reason why ketamine as a sort of double edged sword is that ketamine is an old medication and um, it does give you a high. It doesn't give everyone a high and it depends on the dose, of course. Um, but, you know, in that sense, it's a little bit like alcohol. You can have one drink and it may not do anything to you and you can have 10 drinks and it totally, you know, blows you away. So because it is an old medicine, uh, particularly uh, it came out during the Vietnam War, and because it was incredibly safe as an anesthetic agent, which is its primary use around the world, every day millions of people use ketamine for surgery and for other things. Um, the uh, A lot of people who got exposed to ketamine, whether it was through battle injuries or other things, um, they also became aware of its hallucinogenic properties. And some of them uh, liked it so much, um, you know, that they, they uh, you know, started abusing it, getting it on the street. And that has persisted in, in the same way that other, you know, street drugs are abused. Uh, for 50 years, there's always been some misuse of ketamine as a, you know, essentially as a street drug. So, so one concern is just like the opiate crisis is, uh, you know, or any other drug crisis, uh, are people, you know, abusing it? The way that it works when you're using it as a party drug or to abuse it is about, you know, 20 or 30 times the dose that you would use for depression and is about five times the dose you would use um, in a day anyway for anesthesia. So it's it's really a dose dependent phenomenon. Um, when you start using it heavily, and you use it every day, 
it can cause other medical problems. It can cause um, particularly damage to the kidneys and bladder, and it can cause other things. So there are consequences, but those consequences are mixed in with the fact that it's being abused, as opposed to are there safety concerns when it's used for anesthesia? Are there safety concerns when it's used every day in low doses for palliative care or sometimes even for depression or for chronic pain conditions? No. The, in those situations, we don't see um, a, any adverse consequences, any meaningful adverse consequences. Thank you. I'll be curious um, how it interacts with other medications that people are already taking for depression and whether they tend to take those drugs and or go off of them and, and what can go wrong in that situation, um, how it is different from other psychedelics. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it, do people take that at home on their own or is it always under supervision? Those are some of the questions that I'll be having. Okay. I'll be, I'll be getting into that, but what the one thing I will say, it's not like magic mushrooms. It's not really considered a psychedelic in the tradition of, uh, you know, some of the things you're hearing about, like LSD or psilocybin, uh, it's, it, it is different. It, it causes some of the same effects, but not very much. And, and it's, you know, very transient compared to um, the, you know, LSD or, or magic mushrooms or things like that. Okay, any, any final thoughts or questions before I move on? So what I intend to do is I will pause periodically through the presentation. So, um, you know, I, rather than saving up your questions at, at the end, it's fine to either interrupt me or just wait for a pause during the uh, presentation. I'll be watching for hands as well to go up on the sidebar in case people are muted. A reminder to unmute to ask your questions. Okay. Um, can you see the... Um, the slide properly now? Okay. All right. So why is it that we're, we're even talking about ketamine? Um, well, the reality is uh, we all know how common depression is. Uh, the, the standard treatments work extremely well for about a third of people. For another third, they give some relief, but, you know, only partial. Less, you know, maybe 40%, maybe 45%. Um, and for one third, they, they really don't do anything. And so that I mean both psychotherapy and uh, standard antidepressants. For about a third of people, the, neither psychotherapy nor medications really click. So people have said, we need to have alternatives. Many of the people who do uh, have some success with antidepressants, sometimes the antidepressants stop working. That's another phenomenon. And sometimes, just like, you know, if you know anyone with asthma, the standard asthma inhalers work most of the time, but sometimes you have a big crisis and you have to go to the emergency room and get an extra uh, kind of treatment because your standard treatments for asthma didn't prevent, you know, a severe asthmatic attack. So in the same way, depression can be largely controlled for many people with standard treatments, but once in a while you get a, a very strong episode and, um, you know, that's the, the standard treatments uh, aren't strong enough. So, um, sorry, I'm just having a little bit of trouble because of the, okay, I'm going to have to just go back. All right. So, um, this is actually something that Michigan can be proud of. The um, what happened was at the end of the Second World War, uh, there was a tremendous push to find new anesthetic agents. There were things the equivalent of laughing gas and other things like that that were very in our in our consider uh, our terms now they were very crude ways of putting people under for operations, and the various treatments that existed had all kinds of other complications like they might raise your blood pressure. The occasional person would have a, a severe allergic type reaction and so on. So uh, in the 1940s, it was not uncommon to die, not from the surgery, but from the anesthesia. So there was a tremendous search for agents and um, they they actually turned to drug uh, to medicines that we now think of as street drugs, including things like 
uh, PCP and LSD because they do actually work in some ways as anesthetic agents. But of course, they give you much more than that. And so um, chemists were saying, we need to find something else. And what they did is they just played around with some of the older molecules that were similar to PCP or LSD and say, let's tweak this chemi the chemistry this way or that way and see if we can get something and that still works as an anesthetic, but doesn't give you much of a trip and is also safe from a blood pressure and so on perspective. Um, so it was actually synthesized in Detroit. And uh, the first use of it in humans was actually in 1964, uh, you know, in uh, through the University of Michigan. And it quickly was found to be remarkable as, as an anesthetic agent. And what was most remarkable is that it didn't give you any uh, serious cardiac or respiratory problems. Many of the people who got anesthesia in those days would have all kinds of respiratory issues. And so this was a major uh, drawback. And it was also found that the this anesthetic agent could be given all kinds of ways. So the standard way we give it is it comes as a liquid and you inject it through an IV. However, you can give it as an injection directly into your muscle. Uh, you can also... Um, you can you can even drink it. You can make it into a liquid and drink it. But the main thing is that uh, because it was very safe and it could be given as an injection directly into a muscle, it was felt like this is a real solution because now any clinic where they have to do something, and this could be a minor procedure like uh, getting your wisdom teeth out or something like that, um, you could use it without having to call you know a, an anesthesia specialist and so on. And actually, um, it quickly caught on. As I mentioned, it was used widely on the battlefield in Vietnam. And um, it, it actually was tested in children and found to be remarkably safe for children. So there are many children who get some minor procedure done, um, something the equivalent of like, you know, getting your wisdom teeth out. And they get it in an outpatient setting. Um, and they just get a shot. They go to sleep for an hour or something. And during that time, the minor medical procedure is done and they don't have to go to the hospital and so on. So because of that, um, it, it was uh, declared in the 1970s as one of the world's 10 most essential medicines. Uh, it's, it's one of the medicines you want if you're stranded on a desert island. And, uh, it was used, and it was used and it is used by millions of people every day um, for anesthesia primarily, but uh, for some other uh, reasons as well. Now, ironically, the, the, there was a, a, a pharmacologist at the University of Michigan known as Ed Domino, and he's really the father of, of uh, ketamine in use in humans. And he noticed that when he was giving it to some of his patients, partly in the initial stages, just to find out what it did, and also uh, for pe people who were getting it for anesthesia and all that, some of them said, hey, this makes me feel better days later too. And he just thought that was like nonsense and he didn't pay any attention to it. And that was one of his great regrets, he said, uh, because eventually somebody did pay attention to that effect. And uh, there, was a, there were some researchers at Yale who did a study with just seven patients with really bad depression. And they didn't think it would work, but they had some other reasons to, to try it. And they gave it to seven people and within two hours, these seven people who had each had, you know, multiple medicines, were feeling terrible and all that, within hours, they were well, and most of them stayed well for a few days up to two weeks. So it was a temporary thing, but a single infusion, low dose, not enough to put them to sleep or anything, had a dramatic effect. So during, during the 2000s, uh, a few other research groups said, well, we don't really think this is going to work, but since you did it, let's try it ourselves. And they were surprised. They also found that it was effective. So around 2010, it was established that low-dose ketamine given through an IV uh, works pretty well for tough cases of depression. And between 2010 and 2015, then some larger studies were done. But because this was an old medicine, no drug company was championing it. And the way you know medication research goes, um, it's very expensive to do the kinds of studies 
that prove that a treatment works. Uh, and, and, you know, if you want to get something approved by the FDA, it takes uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, basically, to get a new medicine uh, tested and approved by the FDA. Now, since this is a generic drug, no, no one was going to do that. And on the flip side, doctors being very pragmatic, they'd say, well, if there's clinical evidence that this works, there are reasonable research studies and the drug is available on the market, which it is, we can use it. We don't need an official FDA blessing. And, and probably half of all medicines that are used, not just in psychiatry, but in, across medicine, are, are approved for one thing, tested and found to be useful for one thing, and then tested in research but not necessarily approved by the FDA for other uses. So this is a, a long tradition within medicine. So the primary use of ketamine is uh, for depression right now, but there are other psychiatric conditions for which it's being used. Um, the question about why does it work? Well, I like to, to, to talk about this in, a, in a, the analogy of, of making a curry, all right? If you think about um, cooking, Sometimes you can say, well, you know, I added one spice and that spice was really effective and that's why the food tasted good. If you're making a curry, you're, you're using an amalgam of multiple spices. If you're using an SSRI antidepressant, you're mo mostly working on the serotonin system, although the brain has probably, you know, 150 neurotransmitters of which maybe five are really big and very prevalent, of which serotonin is perhaps uh, is number two. Um, but maybe you're putting all your emphasis on on just one thing. It's like if you only cooked with cinnamon or something like that. Um, ketamine works on multiple systems, but the main system that it works on is something called the GABA and glutamate system. And it turns out that GABA and glutamate, these are two, two chemicals in the brain naturally occurring. They are actually much more prevalent in the brain than serotonin, or dopamine or norepinephrine, which are the three chemicals that, you know, in psychiatry, we usually talk about the most. We knew about GABA and, 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 um, and glutamate, but we sort of thought that they were more bystanders, e even though they were um, in terms of numerical uh, amounts of how much of that chemical was in the brain was more than serotonin or dopamine. We thought that it was just like background material, but it's emerged that this background neurotransmitters are actually, um, you know, critically important. And because they're so widespread, if you fiddle with the tone or the amount of either GABA or glutamate, it's kind of like uh, turning up the temperature or turning down the temperature of the entire brain. And that's why it affects uh, all kinds of symptoms very quickly. Whereas the, the other chemicals, they're working on very specific areas of the brain and so it takes a while for that specific attention to one small area of the brain to make a difference in symptoms like depression. So what, what do the research findings show about ketamine for depression? So if I have someone that every day, I, you know, I see people with treatment refractory depression, and these are individuals who've tried three, four, five uh, antidepressants, they've had at least one form of psychotherapy, and maybe they were a little bit better, but basically they're still suffering. What's the chance that another antidepressant will work? Uh, any guesses? If if you knew somebody who's already tried, say, four medicines, what what's your guess about the chances that the next medicine is going to really do a good job? It seemed like it'd be very likely. Very likely or unlikely? I would think unlikely. But. Yes. Yeah. So the, the answer is that it's only about 15, one, five percent. Okay. So it's 85% likely that the next medicine you try will not be very effective for you. Uh, in contrast, if you give ketamine, it's about 50%, more than 50% will have a dramatic uh, and full recovery. If you have electroconvulsive therapy or ECT, it's about 80%. So that's still stronger. Um, but ketamine is much stronger than just trying another antidepressant. The other thing that's different about it is you can notice the effects within a couple of hours. So the way the ketamine is given is it's given through an IV and runs into your system for 40 minutes. During those 40 minutes, 
after about 10 minutes of the infusion, you start to feel a mild sense of intoxication. And depending on the individual and depending on the dose of ketamine used, you may feel mild hallucinations or vivid colors, uh, a little bit of a psychedelic experience, and so on. Um, 10 minutes after the infusion stops, those symptoms have faded, um, but you often feel relaxed and good. And that feeling, if you give just one infusion, that'll last a few days for most people, but it won't last for weeks. It might last a week or two, but it won't last longer than that. So what we do is we usually give it two or three times a week for uh, three or four weeks. And that, if we did nothing else, that would last for probably a few months, but we don't want to take any chances. So we usually combine it with um, some other medication as a kind of insurance policy that we're we're using it in the best way, the most comprehensive way. So the most common form of ketamine that's used is IV ketamine. This is the way it's manufactured. It's manufactured as a liquid. You mix it in an IV bag and you run it in. Um, because it's a widely available medicine and it was originally an anesthetic agent, lots of anesthesia doctors give it both for pain and some of them uh, as a sort of side hustle also run clinics where they get, try to give it for depression patients, even if they don't you know, have a depression specialist in their clinic. So that's one of the controversies. ER physicians use ketamine acutely in the emergency room when they want to help somebody who's injured and they want to give them some you know, immediate anesthesia while they're giving them some stitches or something like that. Um, and so ER physicians are very used to it as well. And so some of them who are entrepreneurial have opened up ketamine clinics for depression. And, and so, you know, they are providing a service, but they often are not providing uh, comprehensive care and, you know, they're not depression specialists. So that, that's been somewhat controversial. Now, the way ketamine comes, it's, it comes as a, uh, a, a molecule that has two forms. And the best explanation for that is think of a pair of gloves. And this is true of a number of medicines or a number of chemicals that the, the, the chemical is not only one, it's not only right-handed, it has handedness, like right-handed or left-handed. And the natural way that it's made is that it's, it's a mix of right-handed medicine and left-handed medicine. So imagine a barrel of uh, just carrying uh, a pairs of gloves, and it'll have an equal number of right-handed gloves and left-handed gloves. So what um, one company did, a number of researchers did this, but one company said is, well, let's see if we separate out the the right-handed or the left-handed, that we can patent. And, um, and they found that the left-handed version of ketamine uh, seemed to work particularly well. So one company, Janssen, said, let's study this. And we know that IVs are a hassle. Why don't we look at it some other way? And they looked at it and said, maybe we can develop it as, uh, it as a spray that you spray into your nose, just like a, a, you know, a nasal spray for congestion or something like that. And there's fairly good absorption that way. The reason they didn't develop it as a pill, by the way, I didn't mention this, is it's not very well absorbed when you swallow it. So it's also very uneven how it gets absorbed. So if it's, if it's inhaled, if it's sprayed in your nose, if it's put in an injection, or if it's given in a, as an IV, those are much more reliable ways of, of, of giving it. So uh, they developed something uh, that is now known commercially as spray bottle. Um, now, here is our, you know, not very spa-like environment that where we give ketamine at at, at, the, at Michigan. So this is in a recovery room. Uh, we we actually use this space for ECT. Um, people have ECT in another room, just like they have surgery in another room. And then after they had their procedure, they come here to recover for about an hour. And so we were able to use some of this room. The patient comes in, they, they're in the hospital for two or three, well, three, about three hours. They talk to, they've already been assessed by a psychiatrist. They've been cleared for ketamine. They would come in. Um, okay, you're going to come in Tuesdays and Thursdays for the next four weeks. They come in, the nurse assesses them for about half an hour. Then they lie down on the bed. They get hooked up with a cardiac monitor and IV is started and all that. The psychiatrist again talks to them 
briefly to make sure that they're all okay. They get their infusion over 40 minutes. They have to stay in the hospital for another hour. Their vital signs are checked and, you know, they're asked how they're doing and so on. And then the psychiatrist sees them again before they're discharged. So um, that that's the, this is where we do it. And our results, based on one study, I have some statistics here. Just over half had complete remission um, just after three infusions. Now, we don't stop at three, but just to give you the, a sense of the power. So within two weeks, half of the patients that I see in, uh, you know, quite regularly as being severely depressed, half of them were completely well. And so to consult, to lock that in, we would give them more infusions and also tweak their other medicines. 25% might have some benefit and about 20%, it didn't touch them at all. Um, so right now, uh, we've talked about that. The, the spray form is called uh, Spray Vado and it's the scientific name is Esketamine. And the way it's given is it has to be given with a standard antidepressant. Uh, so it's not given by itself. You don't tell people, okay, I'm now going to give you ketamine, whether it's S-ketamine or the IV ketamine, stop all your medicines. No, it actually doesn't interact much with other medicines. It's safe to use with other medicines. So we usually say, do you think your current treatments are helping somewhat? Okay, then we'll go ahead with it. If they're not helping somewhat, let's begin the process of changing those other medicines, but we'll also add the, the ketamine or the S-ketamine. So the main way you hear about it now is through the commercial route. And um, it's a pretty complicated uh, process, which is shown here in this kind of cartoon. So a doctor has to see the patient, say that they have treatment refractory depression, and go through a series of questions to see if this person is eligible to get uh, the spray vado. The spray vado is dosed one spray at a time. And, and every time you're giving a treatment, the patient um, has to come in and you have to write a prescription and you, meaning the doctor, has to get the prescription. The patient does not go home with the, the medication or anything like that. You watch them uh, use it, spray it in their nose, and then they have to stay in your office for two hours just to make sure they're fine and then they can go home. So this is what the device looks like. It's a single use device. It has two sprays, one for each nostril. You just It's exactly like any of those commercial sprays that you use to, for decongestion in your nose. You know, you just squeeze it, one spray, one nostril, put it in the other nostril, one squeeze, one spray comes out and goes in the other nostril. Um, this device uh, is manufactured only for this medicine spray vado, and uh, it's very expensive because it's patented and all that kind of stuff. Um, and and it goes through this elaborate process. Um, I'm just gonna race through a couple of these slides. I deliberately kept them here just so you, you will have some sense of it. The, the five blue boxes on the top, each blue box represents one large study done with the spray. So they actually studied it pretty well. And the, the first five studies were all sort of really um, more of the short term. And then they have done several studies uh, over, over the long term. So in the short term, what would happen is somebody would come in, they would have to be on a new antidepressant that they hadn't had before, and they get the spray twice a week, and they usually get it twice a week for four weeks, then they get it once a week for four weeks, then once every two weeks for four weeks, and then you you as a clinician decide what to do with it. And the hope was that this was kind of like a booster and it would get you out of the pit. And then once you were well in say month two or something, the regular antidepressants would work better. Um, these are the kinds of results. So when when in, in some in, in these studies at four weeks, if you just started a new antidepressant, you had a pretty good response rate of 52%. And I can go into why that's so high when I told you before, only 15% respond. It's because of some other factors in the study. But if you actually had the new antidepressant plus the spray bottle, about 70% were doing pretty well at week four. So that, that was the magnitude uh, of difference. 
Um, we've studied ketamine in a variety of ways. We've produced some articles. This is one large report that I'm a part of, which really examined what's what are the key questions about how ketamine should be used for depression. Um, and so here's what we settled on. Um, first of all, we don't want to use it early in depression. Now, that may change in 10 years or five years as other research goes on. Maybe we won't force people to go through SSRIs and all that. But right now, we expect that people start and take standard antidepressants, and they have to have, have, to have had at least two and usually three or four that didn't work before we say, okay, it's worth trying ketamine. We haven't studied ketamine much in either uh, the kids or the elderly, so we don't have much um, much use of it in those populations. And um, one of the problems that we have is where where should we give it? Because it's it's a time intensive treatment. Should we give it only to the most severely ill? Um, should we give it earlier? You know, should we maybe start doing it after one antidepressant doesn't work? We don't know, but. These are some of the dilemmas that we face as clinicians where we have a limited resource and how should we spend it, so to speak. There are some reasons why you should not get ketamine. If you have any kind of psychotic symptoms, if you're delusional, if you're paranoid, ketamine will worsen that or can worsen that. The one side effect, the one medical side effect that ketamine does have is that while it's infusing in you for those 40 minutes, it raises your blood pressure a fair bit. And if you already have high blood pressure, it can you can shoot it through the roof. It's it's a bit like you know shooting somebody up with uh, just adrenaline. It's short, but it definitely raises your blood pressure and your your heart rate. Um, if you do have other medical problems, you would want to make sure that those are stable before you gave somebody ketamine. If you're actively abusing alcohol or other drugs, ketamine can be problematic. Although there's now some use of ketamine to treat addictions. But right now, we're, we're, we're cautious about people who are currently uh, suffering from addictions. We're careful. We generally don't use ketamine in those situations. We do know that ketamine uh, is potentially toxic to the fetus, so we would definitely not use it you know, um, uh, during pregnancy. Um, and it should be done in a setting that's safe. I showed you the picture of where we do it. The main thing is you don't need an anesthesia doctor. It's actually pretty safe. Even psychiatrists can give it, you know, so uh, it, it's pretty safe. Um, what are the common side effects? Well, I mentioned them a bit, but during the actual infusion, you often feel like you're floating. Uh, you do have an increase in heart rate and blood pressure. You are feeling a bit intoxicated. Sometimes people have nausea or headaches, but it's usually only during the, you know, less than an hour uh, that you're infusing them and then uh, you know shortly after stopping the infusion. Uh, when they go home, they might be tired, but people don't report like, you know, oh, I had terrible dry mouth or I had ter you know, terrible nausea the next day or things like that. It's really during the hour or so of giving ketamine that you have the side effects. Um, are there any long-term risks? We, uh, you know, I alluded to this at the beginning from drug abusers, who use 10 times or 20 times as much ketamine as we use every day, you know, in, in, to get high and so on, they can have some uh, brain impairment. They can have some problems with uh, serious uh, bladder problems and so on. We have not seen that. And we and many, many other groups who give it for psychiatric reasons, we don't see any of these kinds of difficulties, but, you know, it, it is a theoretical risk. We have studied this, and this is my last slide. We did a, a, a significant study of this, and, and this was the study that showed us that even with three infusions, about half of the people were dramatically better. So that's the, the overview of ketamine. I'm happy to take some questions. So um, uh, when we see this, um, the place where you do it at Michigan, I, I, because we have a few members who've told me that they are using ketamine for depression. This is why I was interested in for us knowing more about it. But they are going to clinics that are not at the hospital. There's a like there's a clinic not far from the church that some people have gone to. Are those 
What do you think about those clinics versus what you're talking about at Michigan? Yeah, you know, it really depends on how conscientious the the doctor running the clinic is. So some clinics are run by very conscientious non-psychiatrists who have good qualifications either in anesthesia or emergency room medicine, and therefore they have lots of experience giving ketamine for other reasons. So they administer it in a very safe fashion and all that. Um, they they don't tend to assess the depression themselves. Some collaborate with psychiatrists. So it's kind of like, you know, if you send somebody for physiotherapy, um, you collaborate with the physiotherapist. So some psychiatrists will send their patients to one of those clinics uh, and then they will, the psychiatrist will continue to monitor how the depression is going, but the actual treatment with the ketamine will happen with the, you know, in the private clinic. And that model can work fine. Uh, but it does depend on the the other clinic's um, philosophy. Some other clinics, even clinics where, you know, I've collaborated with, uh, before we had our own IV ketamine clinic, I would send my patients to the existing ketamine clinics run by ER physicians or whatever. And I thought they did a good job. But what has sometimes troubled me is they've gone on to say, well, you know, it, since it works so well for depression, let's try it for all, all kinds of other things. And compared to us, they're much more liberal in using it for other illnesses that the research hasn't really uh, been established that that's good. And so it's it's a little bit iffy. And would people, I mean, if you're using the nasal spray, would you ever send it home with somebody and say, all right, here's your prescription, you're going to take it at night? Or is it always in this controlled setting? Yeah, So so this is where... Um, you, you can do other things which are both good and bad. You can take the liquid ketamine, which is you know uh, manufactured. You can get a compounding pharmacy to mix that in a variety of ways. And a few people have mixed it with a solution and literally given a like a spray bottle to the patient to go home and use it. Um, I, and I did try that, you know, 10 years ago, I tried that for a few patients. What I found and what other colleagues have found is w when you do it that way, the patient doesn't properly control how much they're spraying. Sometimes they spray too much, sometimes they spray too little, and that can lead to all kinds of problems. So we officially really now frown on that. The other way that you can do it is you can get the liquid and have it put into like a uh, some sort of a capsule, or it's put in something that's like a gummy bear that that disintegrates in your in your mouth, uh, because when it dissolves in your mouth, you're not swallowing it. It's better for absorption than swallowing it. That can be okay, and I, I certainly have patients that I do that with. But I'm very careful how many of those I give for the patient to take home. I monitor them. Um, there have been some commercial services that have really abused that, so. They, they, what, especially with the pandemic, what happened is a number of uh, these uh, telemedicine companies came in. You can make a, a one time appointment with them. Oh, yeah, you're depressed. I think you need uh, oral ketamine. And they would prescribe this. And they didn't know the patient. And they would prescribe some of these uh, things. And, you know, I think that was very unwise. Mm -hmm. I don't want to hog all the questions. I want to make sure other people can ask. I'm I'm so fascinated by it because I've talked with members who have used it and said it just worked great. And then all of a sudden it stopped working or they, you know, I, I feel like when we talk to people that have clinical depression, this comes up, situational depression, no. And we want to be able to respond with, with good questions without um, knee jerk reactions to it. So that's a part of why I'm asking for us to be educated about it tonight, but um, does it seem to be that it can work for a while and then lose its efficacy and people have to go off of it and then come back later or just quit it altogether? Um, most people, it, it continues to work. Like if it, it either works or it doesn't, you know, so there aren't there aren't that many people for whom it stops working. And and for the people for whom it stops working, I would wonder if they were getting, a, you know, some sort of placebo effect or something like that. Um, because what we have is the people for whom it works, we're able to give it less often and it still works. And and then sometimes they they stop it altogether and they're just continuing on some other antidepressant. 
But if they run into a rough patch, you know, six months later or three months later, sometimes we just give them a top up infusion or two and then it works again, you know. So that's why I'm saying for, for the people for whom it works, it typically st keeps on working. That 52% uh, or the even the higher 70% was kind of stunning to see that. Um, and it just depression being so rampant. Now I'm, I'm, I'm so, so interested in how this is working. And do, there was something I saw about uh, ketamine in palliative care. And we work with a lot of, we have a lot of older members, some of who are at every age going on in hospice and palliative. Is, is that something that you're seeing an uptick in as well? Uh, yeah, th th that's where um, a lot of it came from before it came into psychiatry. And one of the things that uh, ketamine does, other than its effects on GABA and glutamate, is it also it affects the opiate receptors. So it's a little bit like giving morphine, okay? And that's also one of the reasons why some people hate it, because uh, including some psychiatrists, they say, oh, you know, they, they get carried away saying, oh, it's just morphine, you know, and, and you're just making people high. And that's just not true. But that's the way some people choose to to think of it. But because it does have distinct morphine-like qualities as well, and it helps relieve pain, uh, for decades, it's been used, particularly in the United Kingdom, in palliative care. And the way we use it, whether it's S-ketamine or IV-ketamine, it's only two or three times a week. Um, the way it's used in palliative care or chronic pain sy sy syndromes, it's a daily treatment, and it might even be twice a day, kind of like a standard painkiller. The doses are much smaller, but then they are used more frequently. And it's it's been dramatic. Like the initial studies in palliative care units where people were not only in pain, but like essentially saying, kill me now, um, they felt so much better that they were very grateful for the last month of their life to be not depressed, you know, and to be able to talk to their family or whomever. Um, so it has dramatic utility in palliative care. Most doctors don't know about it. Um, and most doctors are still skeptical of it because it's not huge studies. I mean, who no, you know, people don't tend to do large studies in palliative care. So it's, it's met with a lot of skepticism. Um, but I can tell you there are enough small studies and I, I certainly have seen, you know, a few patients here and there where I've also prescribed it in, in extreme pain situations or palliative situations, and I've seen the benefit. So it definitely has some utility there. And if you really want to know how to use it, it's somebody should go to the UK because they, they use it very commonly in the UK. Thank you for answering my questions. We have a ton of medical people in this <laughs> Zoom, and maybe some of these nurses and others folks have questions that they want to bring as well. Just unmute and ask away. I was just wondering how addictive it is. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think that um, we, we don't find people who use it twice a week report any kind of craving for it or anything like that. Um, I think if somebody were to use it every day, uh, particularly, you know, all, all addictions it's uh, are, are driven by frequency and dose. Like if you have a lot of it, and you have it frequently, then you get like, whoa, whoa, it's great, it's great, it's great. And that's when you get addicted. Um, so we don't see any addiction problems with twice a week. Uh, with the people who who take it, you know, like in palliative care or other situations, they, they're taking it in small doses. They don't get a high from it at all. They get the pain relief, but they don't get any kind of psychedelic experience from it. So they don't feel like any urge to like take two of them or something like that. That that might have answered my question, but as a as a longtime ER nurse, um, when we saw ketamine used um, as a drug of abuse or recreation, um, my my impression was it was not morphine like that. Though these people were combative and really out of control. Is that just dose related? Yeah. So um, I I think. You know, in high doses, it makes people semi-psychotic, okay, or somewhat, you know, so they, just like, you know, low doses of alcohol may make you pleasant, high doses of alcohol may make you a raging, you know, um, angry person. So to some extent, it's it's that. 
Thank you so much for this presentation. I wanted to ask, uh, did you already mention what drug class ketamine is a part of? Well, I mean, it's it's classified in its own class, uh, so okay. I'm not, yeah, so it, it doesn't fall into any of our sort of psychiatric families or anything like that. Okay, and I was also curious, you know, we've talked a little bit about how, uh, a large dose can be problematic in the community. It sounds like this is a really <laughs> highly regulated and well um, controlled substance. And so I just, I was curious about how individuals in the community acquire such a high dose that could be unsafe for them or others. Uh, it's not difficult to manufacture. And so mm -hmm. in the same way that, you know, people pump out fentanyl and all these other okay. things, I, I think uh, illicit places can do that. There's also diversion. And because, you know, it is made in, in industrial quantities for anesthesia around the world and all that, I'm sure mm -hmm. that there are times when uh, some, of, some of the supply from like medical warehouses or, or the mm -hmm. factory where it's made, you know, some of uh, somebody steals some of it and, and, and that's how it uh, gets distributed. Okay, thank you. That when I was on the burn service uh, during my surgery residency, they uh, we used it for anesthetic to debride the burns, but we were very concerned because we didn't know which patients were going to be psychotic, and so that I think that was in much higher doses than you use, though. Yeah, because uh, when you when you're facing that kind of thing, you know the when you're manipulating a wound, a burn wound, which is extremely painful, you you basically have to use a, a, a typical anesthetic like dose. The anesthesia dose right now is four to five times what we use in our depression yeah. clinic, and so you were probably using something similar to that, maybe just a trifle less. And when it's that high. Um, yes, you can start provoking. But either you put the person to sleep or you leave them in a potentially agitated state. Other questions? All right. Well, thank you for a very informative presentation, Dr. Parikh. We so appreciate you coming to us from San Juan and giving <laughs> us your time. I don't know how often this will come up for us, but I think for us to have knowledge and awareness is critical. And it looks like this will be happening a lot more and, and moving along in terms of our, our options for people with all kinds of pain. So it's very, very helpful to know about it. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Yeah. And uh, if you have questions, uh, you know, feel free to uh, send me an email. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Appreciate it.